Africa and it's going to yield like a year in two months of Africa. So thank you, Flavia. We've been doing this and they support us. We've been supporting them as much as we can. You know, we are proud you know, to know them as our partners. And uh, we have also one, several organizations, you know, that, you know, when we do this, several, uh, the IPS and then uh, the Institute for Policy Studies and uh, NSOP Coalition. And then we have uh, Maurice Carney, uh, uh, who is the director and founder of the, the Friends of the Congo, uh, a great activist. <laughs> and then, uh, so we here, because we've been doing this because of you know, some of the names I've mentioned. And today we were surprised to, uh, to hear that uh, Voice of America was going to come and cover this conference. I was so shocked. Then uh, even though I could not go to the barber, I have to put, I have to dress, I have to, I have to, I have to dress on that family here because of Voice of America. Thanks also to Vince, uh, Vince TV, you know, for their partnership. My presentation is going to be about this Pan-Africanism matters. That's the topic of my uh, presentation. So when we talk about Pan-Africanism, uh, we heard, I heard uh, like, for, uh, like, let's say eight years ago, uh, we went, I wanted to do a, 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 a panel, uh, you know, a, 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 like a workshop with some of my friends at Sankofa. And then the room was full of, 90% of the people were there were from Africa. And uh, they were so scared. Onyaka, you know, what you want to do to be a friend of you, you know, use any other word. Do not use Pan-Africanism. If you do use that word Pan-Africanism, white people are going to come after us. <laughs> well, we may want to support you. Please do not use the word Pan-Africanism. <clears throat> and this is how I realized that, you know, maybe I was doing it like a dangerous game. Because I do not understand how Africans could be scared of being part of a Pan-African project. And then I reflect on their attitude, and later on I understood you know, why they were so traumatized. And then in my presentation, then we see certainly why they were so scared. Pan-Africanism is a movement. The word was coined in 1900 by Sylvester William. But we can even say like at least more than 150 years, or even 200 years, before Sylvester William coined the word Pan-Africanism, the Pan-African reality was already in force. What is Pan-Africanism? It is the vision of the unity of the country of Africa and the people of African descent and the diaspora. So many of the people that we admire, many of them, somehow, they, have, they, know, they, you know, they express their position about Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism, even from 1750 to 1850, that, that period was called the Age of Revolution. I can, I can mention four of them. We have uh, the French Revolution uh, from 1789. We have the American Revolution from 1776. We have the Asian Revolution from 1791. And we have the Industrial Revolution. Out of, out of those, those four revolutions, three are directly related or linked to the Pan-African philosophy. The vision of unity in America, the idea of democracy, uh, the inability of the American Revolution to address slavery was going to lead the slaves here on this world to think about how to connect to the motherland or to the fatherland. Pan-African vision. The French Revolution that spoke about the equality of man was going to inspire you know, the slaves uh, in, in, in San Domingo you know, to start under the leadership of Toussaint Louverture you know, to start that slavery, what that was going to become that Asian revolution. Three of those revolutions. And of course, uh, later on, uh, because even when they did after, after, after the Civil War here, the way you know, black were treated, the racial prejudice and racial discrimination, they thought that they needed to be more connected you know, to the motherland. Sylvester William comes with the words Pan-Africanism. But one thing people sometimes when they talk about Pan-African, they forget is this. Pan-Africanism was a moment of its era. In the 19th century, or towards the 20th century, the world was about nationalism and freedom. We have the unity of Italy around 1870. 
in the unity of Germany, in Brussels, Germany, around the year 70 after the war between Germany and France, 1870, 1871. And even within the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans, there was that idea of the unity of nationalism of, of, the, of the Islamic people. And this struggle was going to lead to World War I. So it is in that context of Pan-Slavism, the, the Italian unity, the German unity, that our ancestors who believed in the unity of Africans and the people of African descent, these are the came and the coin that was Pan-Africanism. Before Sylvester William Du Bois used the word Pan-Negroism. Now, after the world was coined, at the first conference of Sylvester William 1900, Du Bois was going to organize five Pan-African Congresses, 1919, 1921, 1923, 1927, 1945. After the Congress of 1927, many people thought that Pan-Africanism was dead. And this, this sentence is going to make me talk about something about the history of Pan-Africanism. It is a movement that experienced moments of prosperity, and it enters a moment of slight decline that we can call hibernation. It is when, after 1927, Ethiopia, the symbol of the dignity of Africa, the uncolonized territory was, uh, was uh, in invaded by Italy, by fascist uh, Mussolini, that many people around the globe, they were so upset, you know, that they started to organize. That's one of the reasons why, in 1945, the Congress of Manchester was dedicated to the decolonization of the continent of Africa. Marcus Garvey from Jamaica was going to organize those conventions uh, in, in the 20s. And later on, Kwame Nkrumah, who was the Prime Minister of Ghana in 1951, and who becomes the President of Ghana in 1957, was going to become the leading figure of the Pan-African movement. And now, one thing that many people should not, they don't want to look at, Dr. King, the icon of the civil rights movement, was in Ghana at the solemn ceremony of Kwame Nkrumah. And he wrote that sermon, The Birth of a New Nation. And in that sermon, Dr. King was talking about how the Ghana independence had an impact on the civil rights movement in the United States of America. Malcolm X, who was going to create, who, who created later on the organization of the Afro-American unity, it was inspired, and let us spoke about the group of Casablanca, it was inspired by the creation of the Organization of the African Unity in 1963. Two icons here in the, in the U.S. who embraced and advocated the Pan-African vision. Now, the tragedy of Africa is this. In 1963, Silver Sinclair, the president of Togo, was assassinated because he wanted to create the currency of his own. 1961, Patrice Lumumba was from Congo, and that Maurice Kanye talks often because he is the leader of the organization called the Friends of the Congo. He was assassinated in 1961. And in 1964, the one who was going to be called later on, 30 years later, as the father of mankind, Nelson Mandela, in prison for 27 years with many others in South Africa. And then we move on. Malcolm X, in February 1965, was going to be assassinated. And I continue with the assassination of Dr. King in 1968. What kind of people are we to see the brothers among us being assassinated all the time? Then I can understand why people were so traumatized because those who try to do Pan-Africanism, or try to defend the interests of the people within the global African diaspora, they end up either killed, imprisoned, or they experience different type of tragedy. The movement into a moment of hibernation until the, 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 the late 80s with the Free Nelson Mandela's movement and, and the rise of Thomas Sankara, who came you know, to, to revive the Pan-African vision. So now, today, when we know that Pan-Africanism was used to deal with slavery, to deal with colonialism, with apartheid, we can understand that if yesterday Pan-Africanism did matter, surely and certainly today, when the African people are under neocolonialism, 
suffering from, you know, from the weight of globalization and suffering from police brutality and different, different types of, of abuses that Pan-Africanism still matters in the 21st century. Now, one other thing that is important before I conclude. When you talk about Pan-Africanism, people have to know that it is also about the idea of federalism. During colonial time, the European, when they were trying, when they were colonizing Africa, they used the, the created some, some, some colonial federation. And the French, uh, under the French rule, there were two. The West French Africa, composed of eight territories, and then the French Equatorial Africa in the Central Park, composed of, of six territories. Nigeria is a product of what a colonial federation, three territories brought together by the British. And even in the central part of Africa, from 1953 to 1963, under the leadership of, of England, there was a colonial federation for 10 years. Uh, it was the northern, northern Rhodesia, the southern Rhodesia, and the Nyasa land. So you will see that those who use a federal uh, framework <coughs> in order to, to, to enslave Africans during colonial time, the same people went to take the case of France, when they were about to give the independence to those African countries, they dismantled those colonial federations. And then now today when you come and you say that you want to promote Pan-Africanism, people cannot <coughs> understand as if colonial time, like 15 years ago, as if it, we were talking about 500 years ago. Now, some people say, well, how are we going to do it? I come from Ivory Coast, and Ivory Coast is the, the microcombs of the United States of, 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 of the map of the United Africa. In my country, you will see people from various nationalities in my country. You can see you have three million people from Burkina Faso in Ivory Coast. You can see people from Guinea, Mali, from Senegal. This is Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast can be the starting point, and then because of the connection that we have with a country like Burkina Faso, when and if those two countries come together uh, as you know, to revive a Pan-African federal framework, I believe that you know, it is a good starting point for us on a political level in order to give a new life to the Pan-African vision. So this is what I want to say, and then of course if there are some questions, then I'm going to come and answer the question. Thank you very much for your attention. That was, that was fantastic, uh, Naka, Dr. Naka, thank you very much. Uh, before we enter into the next round of our panel, let's give all of our panelists a round of applause, please. <laughs> Sitting here uh, listening to our panelists, it became very evident to me that the one word that comes to mind that each panelist is wrestling with is the word transcendence. Transcendence. Beginning with Dr. Clark, she reminded us with respect to the Pan-African agenda of the power of language and music and the hip hop artists attempt to transcend tribe and clan through language and music. Transcending tribe and clan through language and music. With respect to Netfa, he talked about economics class consciousness, the Pan-African project, and the importance of transcending class within a Pan-African agenda. Our next panelist talked about transcending the psyche, the oppression of white supremacy on the psyche of the black Cubans and exploring the theoretical propositions of Ruth Sims. 
on the black reality and Cuba and transcending that psychological oppression. And then finally, our last panelist provided a historical context, laying out the ebbs and flows of history that generated the peaks and valleys of the Pan-Africanist movement. And so with, with that as an overall framework, what we'd like to do now is ask each panelist to take three minutes and respond specifically to the questions that have been uh, posed to them. Uh, before we do that, the question, sir, that we want you to consider, given what you laid out for us, are considerations that Pan-Africanists should wrestle with as they look to connect the dots, given the challenges and the lessons learned from history as a way forward. So considerations for a way forward. Okay, so Dr. Clark, you're first, and so your question is, you talked about the power of language and music, and in the literature,